please drop your name. Let us know who you are by dropping your name and college and location in chat. Um, I am so excited to uh, welcome you today to our CCC OER webinar and uh, introduce you to our amazing facilitators as well. Just a couple of quick things for housekeeping before I introduce our facilitators. Um, James, do you mind sharing screen then so we can go ahead and get through a couple of those slides with us? Got it. Let's... All right. And tell me if you're seeing the presenter view. Yep, we, we have the right view. And then right. uh, go ahead and go to that next slide, please. All right, so just a couple of quick housekeeping items. We do have professional development webinars monthly offered by CCC OER. I also encourage you to get on our CCC OER listserv so you can get connected, hear more about our events and future resources, webinars and policy and research. You can also meet other members and make connections. Uh, we support obviously OER ZTC degree uh, creation, uh, equity, open pedagogy, and of course, access and student success. Um, let's go into our next slide. All right, so I am so pleased to introduce our two uh, speakers today, James and Michelle. A quick bio on each of them. James Galapa Grossklug has been deeply, deeply involved in uh, open education since 2008. He is my colleague in the California Community System, Community College System, uh, where I also work. And his day job is an academic dean at the College of the Canyons, which is also a California Community College. He also coordinates the California Community College's ZTC degree grant program, which is the largest ever public investment in OER. That's kind of in the title of our presentation today, the big bet, right? Uh, he is an OER fellow for the uh, Mickelson 20 MM Foundation, and he co-leads with the Community College Consortium for OER, the Open for Anti-Racism program. And he's proud that he was the first board chair for CCC OER. So back, uh, welcome... back in the stone ages. <laughs> well, I, we didn't ask you for the dates, James. You just provided that in the bio, so I had to include it. <laughs> I'm teasing. All right. And I'm really happy also to introduce his co-speaker today, Michelle Pilati. Michelle has been actively involved in the Academic Senate for California Community Colleges for over a decade, representing ASCCC in various capacities and playing a role in a wide ver a variety of state level endeavors, including guided pathways, what we call CID uh, designations, statewide career pathways, and our Student Success Task Force, uh, in addition to the implementation of our Senate Bill 1440. Previously, she served as the psychology editor for Merlot and was a founding editorial board member and served as co-editor of the Merlot Journal of Online Learning and Teaching, which is a peer-reviewed online publication that launched in 2005. And prior to her involvement in this statewide work, she served as curriculum chair and distance education coordinator at her college. And with that, I am excited to hand it off to the two speakers. And I will also just say before you leave, we'll be dropping a link for a survey. So please, if you need to leave early, keep an eye out for that link. And thank you so much. And James and Michelle, I'll hand it over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Marina. Thanks so much. And it's so good to be at a CCC OER webinar again. It's been a long time since I've been here. And if you are out there in the audience and you are not a member of CCC OER, uh, please do consider joining. It's the best best thing we've got going in the community colleges nationally. Um, so today's topics, um, uh, you'll see here on the screen, we're going to share a little bit of information with you about California by the numbers. It's a big state. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the origins of ZTC in California. Then we'll provide an overview of this ZTC degree grant program. What is the program formally? And we'll talk about the different supports that our colleges receive both from me serving and my team at College of the Canyon serving as technical assistance provider uh, to our state office and Michelle's fabulous project through the Academic Senate also providing support to our colleges. So uh, I think if you're if you want to want a quick takeaway uh, at the outset, it's that our colleges in California are well supported. Um, moving on. So what's what's the big news here? What's the big bet? Uh, in California, we are blessed with a $115 million investment by the state in the California community colleges so that the colleges can build ZTC degrees or zero textbook cost, cost, zero textbook cost pathways resulting in certificates of achievement for CTE programs or associate degrees for uh, transfer programs. So you'll see the words of our governor here uh, as he announced that investment back in 2021. Uh, we are 
uh, committed in California to disrupt the entire system nationwide. And as you'll see in a second, California has the uh, weight to hopefully do that. Um, we are also very fortunate in California that ZTC is defined in our state education code. So it's, you know, it's official in a sense. So it's not just something that individual colleges are making up. We've got the money from the state and we've got uh, the, the definitions, the, 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 the regulatory language. Uh, you'll see here, uh, community college, ZTC is a, a degree or CTE certificate earned entirely by completing courses that eliminate conventional textbook costs. Uh, including by OER. So that's that's in in uh, in our official language here, which is really helpful. And when I say here, what is what what do we say what, what do we mean when we're talking about California community colleges? First of all, we have 115 community colleges, over 55,000 faculty that we get to work with, uh, and we serve two million students. So it's the largest system of higher education in the United States, if not the world. Uh, you'll see the repeated here, the investment, $115 million investment through uh, the end of 2026. So far, we have awarded $46 million, although uh, this morning uh, the, the state chancellor's office and I were reviewing additional additional uh, 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 applications that came in. So it's probably $46.1 million or something by the end of the day. Um, all of our colleges have been funded. And so far, our colleges are developing over 400 programs, which is really stunning. Uh, it's, and it's really exciting when we think about the, the different types of programs that are funded. We'll share a little bit about that later. Uh, and then Michelle, you wanna talk about your project as well? Sure, hi, uh, good, ap good afternoon everyone. I'm dealing with a lot of echoes. So am I sounding okay to you guys? Yes, okay. yeah, and, and Michelle is coming to us from an airport, so an extra <laughs> special thank you to Michelle for, for being here. Uh, so to give a sense, sense of what we, we, we've been doing, we have established a network of liaisons across the college, over 100, like we have approximately one at every, every college. And we facilitated the awareness of OER through a ton of webinars, um, and we continue to host webinars all, all the time. We've disseminated over 73 openly, li openly, openly, li it's really hard, openly licensed resources um, since we were first funded in 2019. And it's, I want to point out here that there was sort of a lull in state funding for ZTC and OER, and we existed during that lull. And so we were able to continue um, OER and ZTC work um, in the absence of a dedicated ZTC program, um, building up basically an OER infrastructure during that time period. One of the most important things that we've done is establish a team of over 30 discipline leads who curate existing OER and then facilitate OER awareness and adoption. They are out there being our spokespeople for the different disciplines um, and also letting us know what the disciplines need and what's important to them. Um, we have two courses that lots of our colleges are using, um, one on open licensing um, and also one on accessibility. And uh, we've awarded a number of badges, but as I said, they're also both open, open course, so faculty um, at colleges have adopted them. Um, with respect to the ZTC program, we've had one limited role. Um, I say limited, but it was actually, it's actually a pretty huge role. <laughs> um, we have facilitated a process for ensuring that there is not duplication and across the colleges in the work that they're doing so that we don't have the same faculty basically doing the same thing at different colleges. Um, and so what this has meant is that we have facilitated discussions and resource sharing across 28 disciplines um, that led to then um, 152 subgroups. And at this point, we've established at least 22 collaborative projects that are gonna come out of that process. And so that's a small piece where um, we are working directly with the ZTC program, but basically we're in existence as an OER infrastructure for the system. Great, thank Let's go you. Go to the next slide, which is back to you, James. Yeah, thank you. So what, you know, how, how is it that, that California has this incredible opportunity now we've got We've got this great project through the statewide academic senate. We've got this embarrassment of riches almost through the state going to the colleges. Uh, where does that come from? Well, I I think it comes from a, a lot of factors that you see here on screen. First of all, we've had we've got a great legacy of leadership in California. Uh, Kathy Casserly was the first uh, or second 
OER program officer with the Hewlett Foundation, Martha Cantor, of course, and Hal Plotkin uh, with, the, with one of our uh, community college districts. They subsequently went on to the Department of Education. Lisa Pertrides, uh, who, who was with ISKME and runs the o OER Commons. Uh, Jerry Hanley, who started Merlot. Uh, Barbara Ilowski uh, was the author of the first openly published uh, uh, co college textbook. Uh, and Una Daly, of course, was the long time, first and longtime director of CCC OER. So a, really a great collection of, of really influential uh, folks here in California. And of course, CCC OER was funded, founded here in California. There's a long time history of state support for OER, for example, with, with Michelle's project, as well as the ZTC grant program. And we also took inspiration from work that was done elsewhere. The, we might, some of you might remember back in 2000, oh, I think 16, 15, 14, 15, uh, Northern Virginia Community College launched an OER degree. Uh, and then the Hewlett Foundation in 15, 16 uh, invested in a, uh, with Achieving the Dream, invested in an OER degree grant program. Uh, and that sort of that inspiration and all of that legacy added up to a pilot project uh, for ZDC programs here in California in the community colleges from 2016 through 19. So we had that investment. That was a modest $5 million investment. Uh, and then as Ma Michelle mentioned, there was a lull uh, that money expired. And so Michelle and her team successfully advocated for funding to go through the statewide academic Senate to support adoption of OER. And now uh, we are back to uh, a large scale statewide investment in the uh, ZTC pathways. Um, James, there's a, a question in chat. Yes. Um, Paige is asking, are there any campuses implementing any automatic billing, like inclusive access, uh, so-called inclusive access? And if so, what impact are you seeing on your OER work? So I'm going to ask Michelle to address this in a second. So yes, there, there are campuses that are engaged in automatic building or so-called uh, in, inequitable access for their students. Um, it doesn't have any direct impact on our work uh, re, uh, promoting and awarding these, these grants to colleges. Um, all of our colleges have been funded and they've been very enthusiastically uh, applied for the funds. Uh, Michelle, I think you have your fingers a bit more on the pulse of which colleges are doing the uh, in in inequitable access programs or the forced forced purchase programs. Yeah, we have um, three of our colleges that um, have programs. Um, I'm pretty sure I know once definitely is doing um, a per unit charge. The um, what we're not clear about is how that's going to interface with the ZTC program. Is how can you be taking dollars for ZTC? Um, and how can you be marking courses as no cost when students are being automatically billed? And so there's conversations around how that um, needs to be worked out um, and how what they're going to do to essentially back out those courses that are free um, from that billing program. So we that's that's what we know at this point. Uh, but as far as we know, the only full scale um, um, instances of that are just at three colleges in two districts. Great. Thank you, Michelle. And thanks, thanks, Marina, for verbalizing that question. Um, also, this money doesn't just come out of nowhere, right? It, it comes from somewhere and it comes from real people like, you know, like all of us doing the advocacy work, right? Uh, figuring out what it takes to advocate for funding in your state. Uh, so just a couple of, a couple of notes about this and, and, and Michelle, feel free to, to, to ch chime in here. I think it's important that you understand the process. You know, what is the process for getting funding in, in California? Uh, there's a process through, whoa, sorry, my, my phone is ringing, but I'm not taking the phone call. Um, um, there, there's a process for uh, proposals to go in through our state system office to, um, sorry about that. Um, there's a process for us to propose funding through our state system office and, uh, uh, back in 2019, I wrote a proposal to go through our state system office to renew funding for this uh, ZTC program. Then that, in our context, that has to be accompanied through um, through our governor's office, through our Department of Finance, and so on and so forth, and, and, and ultimately through the legislature, you need somebody to shepherd it. But in your context, there might be a different process. So really, the point is to know the process that exists in your state or in your system. Uh, also consider the context. 
uh, when we were successful in receiving the pilot funding back in 2015-16, uh, we had a second term governor who was termed out. He liked the college. He liked education. He wanted to leave a legacy. And we had a budget surplus. Today, we have a budget deficit. What is it, Marina? $40 billion or something? So, you know, so today is not the right day to ask for a large investment. Uh, you have to get yourself in the door wherever, wherever that door might be. You have to have friends who will get you in that door so you can make the pitch. And making the pitch depends, again, on the context. Are your legislators or those who uh, decide on the investment, are they interested in dollar signs and savings? Are they interested in, in equity? Are they interested in student outcomes? Right? How do you shape your pitch? Of course, remember that leadership is a very long game and we, none of us do this work alone and none of us do this work overnight. Uh, Michelle, you wanna add anything here to the advocacy piece? Because obviously you, you have been very successful uh, with your project. Uh, yeah, no, I just wanted to point out that one of the nice things about advocating for this kind of work is that it's easy to advocate for. It's a very simple, simple message. This is about getting rid of the cost of textbooks and then also the added benefit of really being able to make the resources that you work with speak more directly to your students and really reflect them. And so it's a very, very easy message to deliver. In education, often the things we need to advocate for are way more complicated. You can't just explain them in you know, in a couple sentences. And so it's nice to be advocating for something that's similar, that's that's simple um, and that the appeal is really easy to, to um, make clear to people without a lot of explanation. So it, 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 if you're going to advocate for something, it's a good thing to have to advocate for. Absolutely. And, and it's great to do it together with others. You know, to, in, in California, obviously, you know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, an administrator, Michelle is a faculty member, and we're working together. So it, it, that also sends a very strong message to the to our legislature and our friends at the state level. Um, and then it's also really important to have other friends um, in California. We've been incredibly fortunate to have our good friends in the Michelson 20MM Foundation help to create an environment in which our messages can be successful. As a as a uh, 501c3, of course, they do not engage in partisan partisan. Uh, lobbying or advocacy, but they can help to introduce you to people or they have helped introduce us to people. They've helped uh, uh, keep the cause on the radar. So, uh, you know, in addition to acknowledging their fantastic friendship and support, I just would encourage you to figure out in your context, who are the players who can help you get yourself in the door? And that's going to differ by, by state and by system. Um, now back to uh, Michelle for the origins of the OERI. Michelle, if you're there. Yep. Sorry. It's very complicated. <laughs> Going I'm, back. I know. I, I think. Um, so as by, I said, we stuff. came along right when the um, other money was drying up, for lack of a better term. And we came along and proposed um, something simple, just a, a five-year project that would be led by faculty to implement OER system-wide. So we're not asking for money to be able to give to everyone, but money so that we can work with everyone. It's a bit different. Um, and so we proposed that and we said that what we wanted to do is at the end of that initial project period, we would look at what we'd accomplished and figure out what our future funding needs are because it's always more money to get things started. Um, we've been operational for about five and a half years. It kind of depends on how you count, count it from when we um, were awarded the money versus when we actually got it. Uh, and so we got $6 million allocated in the summer of 2018 and we've been still operating on that for um, this time and we're we're good through um, at least part of next year. Um, and I'd like to give a shout out to the pandemic here because the pandemic made it so that we had a couple of years where we just weren't spending a lot of money. And I think as anyone who works in the OER space knows that pand pandemic was actually really good for OER because faculty who were concerned about digital resources and were leery of them had to kind of get over that when we were trying to get resources to students without having to um, be in contact with them. So we are um, where we are and came in and started working with our faculty, um, having just very little time actually fully operating before the pandemic. Um, so that's where we're at. Great, and next slide. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to point out is James just pointed out that he's an administrator, I'm faculty, and I'm a faculty member who's working for, not for our chancellor's office, but for a statewide faculty organization that is all about um, the importance and value of faculty and curriculum and the decisions that we make. 
Um, and so the statewide academic senate has a very clear position in that um, we recognize that not every class is going to get to ZTC with OER, but ASCCC, the academic senate, has um, taken the position that where you can use OER, that it is the best approach um, because it is more sustainable than the other approaches. And then you also have the ability to modify resources. So I just wanted to, I like to put that in there because while we're about OER and ZTC is broader, we of course have to recognize um, that ultimately faculty have the academic freedom to determine how to get their courses to zero. Right. All right, and, and there's a question in chat, um, and this is actually a good one for, for faculty as well as administration, but Jennifer is asking, are there resources dedicated to making OER textbooks meet the accessibility requirements of ADA or even other things like universal design, right? So that's always a, a concern is if we're going to use AR, how do we make them accessible? So any thoughts or resources on that? Sure, I'll, 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 I'll start. Michelle, you please you fill in any blanks that I, that I missed. First of all, uh, in the California Community Colleges, we are incredibly fortunate to have a lot of resources. We have a, a dedicated, what's called an accessibility center for, that's supported by our state system that provides training and resources to all the colleges. Um, each college is funded uh, to uh, have an, uh, an alt alternative media specialist in their uh, disability services office who can support faculty in, uh, in making content accessible. Um, the uh, professional development organization at one, which which Marina uh, uh, directs, uh, offers facilitated and self-paced courses uh, dedicated to accessibility, um, designing accessible online classes, which of course has a carryover. Uh, Michelle's project has created a self-paced uh, course on on accessibility uh, that everyone is welcome to take and adapt to their own to their own uh, college needs, and then. Uh, through the professional development that my team offers, we are just launching a brand new course on the intersection of universal design for learning and OER. So, uh, Michelle, am I missing anything there? Um, I'm going to say that when when we facilitate when we facilitate projects, we have accessibility in there as um, a component of it. Um, and also, when we first started working in Bankruptcy, we made integrating accessibility in all the trainings that we did um, an integral part because we recognized that our goal was to interact with all of our faculty. And so we always wanted to lead with the importance of accessibility. Um, and to that end, we also have done things like worked very closely with My Open Math to address some, address some of the accessibility issues. Um, that they had. And I see Delmar there from LibreTex who work, work with him as well around addressing accessibility. So we, I think we have lots of different places where people are working on ensuring things are accessible. Uh, but I think um, as, as a community, we need to do better with sharing resources that have been remediated and that are accessible so that we're not remediating the same resources. I think that's sort of um, a global issue, I, <laughs> I would argue. Yeah. Absolutely. So James, this might be a good question for you. So in general, Jennifer is asking who pays for adjunct uh, adjuncts for the time it takes to make OER text accessible? Uh, well, we certainly hope that all of the colleges that are receiving funding through the grant program are compensating their faculty for any of the work that they're doing. You know, that that is a local college decision, but I sure hope that each local college is, is compensating both their full-time faculty members and their adjunct faculty members for any and all work that they're doing. Michelle? Couldn't agree more. Yeah. You know, yeah, that, that you know, we, yeah, this should not be free labor. And that's one of the points of the grant funding. And, and I think uh, we can make a very large generalization now that we've already, you know, we funded over 400 programs that the bulk of the funding that the colleges are, are requesting does go to the faculty for their labor. Yeah. Okay, moving on. Uh, we talked a lot about this, this grant program. What the heck is it? And what are we supposed to do with the money? Well, right here on the screen, you see an uh, excerpt from the legislation that authorized the funding. Uh, the goal of the funding or the purpose of the funding is, to is for a college to develop one or more uh, pathways, an existing associate degree, a career technical education certificate program, et cetera, et cetera. In some cases, if it's a brand new program, you have to demonstrate that you're meeting some of these requirements, you know, that it, if it's a CT program, it has a high value in the regional market, et cetera, et cetera, kind of common sense, common sense uh, metrics that you would, would expect. Um, one of the funnest 
most fun, very fun parts of the legislation is this non-duplication clause that tells us uh, that the, the chancellor's office, our state system office that has the funding, that they uh, shall ensure that there is a uh, non-duplication in, in order to, non-duplication of degrees in order to avoid duplication of effort and ensure the development of the greatest number of degrees. So, hmm, it's kind of tricky because when we receive applications from colleges, you know, you can imagine we received, you know, I don't know, 20 applications to do biology, 20 applications to do early childhood education, 20 applications to do history and sociology and English and so on and so forth. Everything that you would expect, those evergreen subjects out there, all the colleges want to do those subjects. So uh, we were faced very early on with a choice. Um, we could say yes to one college and no to all the others, or we could figure out a way to really read this legislation closely and uh, say yes to all the colleges. And that's what we've been able to do. So we're, we focused on the uh, clause there that says we should avoid duplication of effort and we should ensure that the greatest number of degrees are produced. So how do we do that? Uh, thanks to Michelle and her team, um, we have asked colleges, you know, the 20 colleges that propose a history degree, uh, we've asked them to collaborate so that they're avoiding duplication of effort. Not, not every college gets a huge pot of money to do the same thing that the other colleges are doing, but rather the colleges receive a small amount of funding to support their faculty to participate in a collaborative effort that Michelle's team is kindly uh, facilitating. Michelle, you want to say a couple of words about that fun, fun opportunity that you have? Uh, it's one of those things that you say here, we think we can do it, and then you have to figure out how to do it, and then you don't know how it's going to go. Um, but what has been really great is that it, it allowed us to bring faculty together and find out about what resources they've been using. Um, ever since we started our work, that's always been a big question. How did that person get that course to zero? What are they using? And there's been so much interest in that. And now We've gathered that information from all of the co the colleges that were participating in the cohorts, and now we're working on trying to take that to the next level so that we can really have a complete a complete roster, if you will, of what resources our faculty are using, so that when a faculty member is looking to find a resource for a specific course, they can see that a particular resource is something that faculty at you know sixty colleges are already using, and so. Um, that transparency, I think, is something that's really important and will will help the work to um, go forward. And that, for some reason, there's a bot apologizing to me for something. I'm not sure what's going on. <laughs> well, well, again, thank you, Michelle, for taking on that that uh, that uh, massive undertaking of uh, of ensuring that our colleges collaborate when they proposed uh, when multiple colleges have proposed to uh, develop the same degree program. Uh, in addition to you know, history and bio and chem and social and, and, and those uh, expected disciplines. Uh, it's been a great joy to see the incredible creativity in our colleges uh, with their career technical education programs. So here on the screen, you see just a teeny tiny little sampling of the career technical education programs uh, that our colleges are developing as ZTC programs. And for me, it's just been really fun to see that creativity out there, you know, museum studies, supply chain management, you know, on and on and on. Uh, as I mentioned, over 400 programs have been funded and, and approximately half of them are career technical education. So it's really, really, really great uh, to see that creativity. Um, going back to the legislation though, you know, the funny thing is that the legislators and their staff who write legislation, they don't always talk to the experts in the field. So. In the legislation, it tells us that all the assets that colleges develop with this grant program shall be uploaded to cool for ed which is uh, a website that was created by and is maintained by our friends at the California State University System. Some of you, some of you might know Leslie Kennedy uh, as a longtime leader. Uh, so uh, uh, when the legislation was, was written, nobody thought to talk to Leslie or the Cal State System to say, hey, all this content is going to be living in Cool for Ed. And guess what? Cool for Ed is a referatory. It's not a repository. So double oopsie. Uh, first of all, though, Leslie Kennedy and her team have been phenomenal working with us to figure out what we're going to do about this. The short of it is we're going to ask colleges to uh, complete a form uh, to tell us all 
some of this information, all of this information, we're working out the final details, but you get a sense of the information that colleges are going to input into a form that will live on the Cool for Ed website and ultimately link out to another location, whether that be OER Commons or Merlot or LibreText or you know, a Pressbooks instance, et cetera. There are many, uh, many, area, many places where the content ultimately <clears throat> will live. Uh, but that's been another kind of fun, fun discovery. And so if you are out there thinking about going to your legislature and you think you're getting close to, to getting some funding, hooray, but do read the details because uh, those details can surprise you. Um, so what kind of support are the colleges receiving? Uh, on my side, as the technical assistance provider working for the state uh, state system office, uh, colleges are receiving a, a, a lot of different different support. You see that uh, outlined here on the screen. And I want to give a shout out to my good friend and partner in this work, Judith Sebesta, who's here, former former uh, advisory board president of CCC OER. Judith has kindly agreed to uh, serve as project manager for all the technical assistance. So all the all the good stuff that's happening uh, comes back to Judith's organizational skills. Uh, we offer a lot of professional development. Uh, we offer centralized support, OER search, uh, licensing support. Uh, we offer o open office hours for licensing questions, uh, librarian questions, et cetera, et cetera. And then coaching for colleges. We have a network of of experienced OER and ZTC leaders from our colleges who will work with a college that might not have a developed infrastructure. You know, with 115 colleges, not every one of those colleges is at a, let's say, an advanced or intermediate level in their OER work. Some are at the beginning level, but and they want to take the investment, hooray, but they need a little bit of extra support uh, to, uh, to, to be successful. So we, we offer coaches to work with those colleges individually. Um, on the note of professional development, a big shout out to Marina and her team in California running the app, amazing App One Professional Development Network, uh, where they are kindly hosting our professional development courses, uh, which is fantastic for our, our participants because it's, it's a model that they know. Uh, it, you know, App One courses are the gold standard professional development. So in many of our colleges, uh, if you, you're a faculty member, you take an at one course, it's automatically recognized for professional development credit or salary advancement credit. So it's really great for us to be able to, to utilize that platform. Here you see a, uh, an overview of the five courses that we currently offer. Uh, the first three courses there along the top uh, currently live in Canvas Commons. You can find them on Canvas Commons by searching for hashtag ZTCPD. Uh, of course, they're openly licensed. Feel free to download them, modify them. Please let us know, though. It would be fun to know if you are, uh, are modifying them or using them. That would be a lot of fun. Um, our, our, the bottom two here uh, we're, we'll release to Canvas Commons in the near future. The uh, AI course, you know, it's just rapidly developing. We're trying to keep up with it, and uh, we'll probably release that uh, by the end of the year. The new course, Beyond Boundaries, on UDL. Uh, we'll probably release sometime in the new year after we, you know, give it a, give it a couple of couple of goes. Um, and with that, Michelle, back to you to talk about your specific intersection with the ZTC program. Yeah, so thank you. Um, so we're, we're, we're only funded to do the work that we've been doing with the collaboration cohorts, um, but our work naturally supports the ZTC program more generally since we're doing work um, in the OER space. Um, we developed very uh, a project support structure that um, is available to colleges at cost. So if you don't have the expertise that you need locally, you can bring us in to help. Um, and just to note, with the collaboration cohorts, where there were faculty at different colleges that wanted to work on a project together, we were able to provide services with them around figuring out the project, the scope of the project, and delineating the work and the timelines, um, and all those sorts of things. And then we're available to. Do, we're available to be hired and contracted to do additional work. You go to the next slide. Um, we have project facilitators that provide project management, identify deliverables, establish deadlines. Um, I already mentioned our basics and our accessibility basics courses, which both can just be taken for your um, own use, but they also can be taken for college credit. Um, we also provide accessibility support. One of the things that we have that um, is also useful is we have an, a framework around idea, um, inclusivity, diversity, equity, and anti-racism. We don't include accessibility there because we consider accessibility a given. Um, and that is a framework around reviewing resources or also developing them. And the, the three things are um, highlighted there the, in red in part because if you build 
thinking about licensing and thinking about accessibility and thinking about idea, DEI, whatever you're calling it, it's a lot easier to build things with those in mind as opposed to having to come back and retrofit them. And so that's something that we've really been um, advocating for. We also then have connections with LibreText and also we have leads around a number of the different homework systems that are available. So these are all services. Which we lost you, Michelle, you got muted somehow. Sorry, Michelle, you're muted. Looks like we lost Michelle. Um... Michelle, if you can hear us, we cannot hear you anymore. I think we lost you on your audio. All right. All right. And where, where, where'd I go off? Yep, you're back. <laughs> <laughs> the red okay. text. There you I go. Don't... Yep. Here we go. So okay. is this, is this in curated OER collections? Okay. So you did get the part about building it, building with accessibility and building yes. with idea and building good. Okay, yeah. good. That's a really important. Um, so one of the things that we've been doing and really focusing on is helping our faculty find existing o OER. So we have OER collections by discipline, by our old GE areas, and then by our new GE areas. And then also in California, we have transfer degrees that basically guarantee student transfer into the California State University system that are built on a common backbone called a transfer model curriculum, which then has courses. We heard us mention CID, it's a course identification numbering system. So we have this huge system, but we have this mechanisms to allow um, the identification of common of common courses or comparable courses across the system. Um, and then we've also gone in and actually identified specifically where there are gaps in the OER available for courses that are part of those transfer model curriculum. Next slide, please. Um, and one of the things, a um, number of things have been happening as a consequence of our work with the cohorts and getting more and more information. Um, we recognized that we needed to have one place that people could go to find the resources that are in our collection. Um, and that's this collection here, Searchable, AS, um, Searchable OER by CID. And for those of you not from California, it's all those courses that everyone has, American History, IntraPsych, IntraSoc, um, the ones that are very common and that just about everyone has who has the traditional um, academic degrees. Next slide. Um, and one of the things that we're really excited about is we're taking the information that we get from the collaboration cohorts, and now we have a resource where you can go and see what are people working on. And so as our cohorts conclude their work, we are adding to this um, anticipated new OER collection that people can go and look and see what resources are being developed. Michelle, there's a question from Diana and she's saying, are there cohorts around the world uh, languages available like Spanish, you know, French? So the only cohort that we had was Spanish because it, the only way we had a cohort around the language was if we had a number of colleges that submitted for it. So the only one that where we had a cohort was Spanish. We have in our state though, had a lot of work done um, in ASL um, and also Italian and Arabic and I believe French. So we have OER alive and well in lots of the languages here and some exciting things happening in that space as well. Great. And then we've got a slide on your idea framework. Yes. So, um, yeah. So basically, this is something that we began early on, had an initial draft, and then um, did a, a project a few summers back to um, really look at it and make it better and um, think specifically about um, the concepts within the context of the sciences. Um, and then as we looked at what we were doing around having people to help with accessibility and having people to help with licensing, we realized we need a person whose job is to help with idea. And so we have um, an individual now who's available to consult with um, and also is developing an assessment process that was piloted this past summer. Um, and then looking to be able to have that assessment process available to review all the resources that we have supported. And then if anyone is developing resources that they would like to have reviewed um, for IDEA, they can do that as well. Great, thank you, Michelle. And as we conclude, we wanna leave you with, uh, we'll, we'll drop these links in the chat, uh, uh, links to the official chancellor's office webpage, uh, on the pro on the ZTC degree grant program, uh, links to the technical assistance provider page and the academic senate OERI page. So we'll drop those in the chat. And Marina, I'm going to 
turn this back well, to you for questions and ads, Q and A, we got anything in the chat? Yeah, so, so, you know, on the one hand, I'm sure you're very impressed by everything that James and Rochelle are detailing. On the other hand, I have been a Dean at a college that has virtually no OER. And I remember how overwhelming it feels to even get started. So you can be at any part of that journey. And I know that James and Michelle can kind of provide some support or resources or, or answers for you. So um, who would like to ask a question? You could actually unmute yourself or you could drop it in chat or share something that you're doing in your institution that you have a question about. Thank you to Alan. I see Alan's been busy dropping links in the chat. Thank you, Alan. Thanks, Alan. And there is also a survey for this uh, webinar. So please, if you are going to drop off anytime soon, uh, complete that survey. Let us know how you feel how you feel about things. Let us know about topics for future webinars. We're here to support you. Um, the slide that you're looking at are our next two webinars coming up in November and December. Uh, on November 20th, it's going to be around open ed and indigenous knowledge. And on December 11th, we're going to talk about the use of OER in Illinois and equity questions and opportunities. So uh, you can register for it in the link provided as well on the bottom of that slide. And Alan also dropped it off in, in chat for you if you need a copy of that. Sir, uh, so, sorry, Sari Kirby has um, a question in chat. She says, I see that you mentioned the anticipated new OER on the OERI website. Will the new OER materials created under the ZTC grant also be available on the OERI website as well as Cool for Ed? That's a Michelle question. We would, yeah, we would absolutely be linking to everything. So we we want it. We we still want to continue to be that place where you can go. So absolutely, when those things come in, we'll add them. So you'll be able to go to like the page for a particular um, TMC or a particular discipline and find them there as well. Good question. And Eileen has. <laughs> Eileen's got a comment. She says, in Hillsborough Community College, uh, we're just getting started with the OER creation program, and she dropped a link there as well. And that's cool, too. You know, we, we really need to be able to honor people at every stage. My college had about five courses that were OER when we started our project, and within about four or five years, thanks to a lot of the work that you, hear, you heard about today, uh, we moved to almost a third of all courses as uh, OER. And I think right now I've left that institution, but I think it's even more than that. So yeah, well, and and to to the Hillsboro uh, program, I mean, all the work that's been created in California that's available to you, right? You know that you don't have to start from scratch. You don't you don't necessarily have to start with authoring, right? A lot of what, especially if we're talking about the classic transfer courses, the SOCH, the Psych, the Bio, etc. Really, you're starting with adopting or adapting, but there's there's really no reason that we need to author another U.S. history textbook or another intro psych textbook. Any other questions, thoughts, or shares from your own institutions for our amazing speakers today? All right, I'm not seeing anything. I'm doing the five second teacher wait. Um, <laughs> so I, I just want to take a moment to thank all of you for giving us your time today. Please, please take a moment and fill out our survey to let us know um, what kind of topics you're interested in the future. And uh, thank you, Michelle, for, for getting on here, even though you're traveling and you're managing <laughs> multiple devices. We're really grateful. And James, I know you just came in from the OER conference last week. So we are really, really grateful for your time today. And thanks, everyone. We will have this material, um, the archived presentation available for future use as well, if you'd like to share with colleagues. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And I'm, I'm happy to hang out if anybody has, uh, has questions or comments. Yeah, we have a little bit of time if folks want to hang in there and talk to our speakers. You know, you know, one thing that we didn't really talk that we didn't talk about formally was sort of the difference here. I'm going to stop slide share. Um, you know, is the difference between adopting OER and working with your discipline faculty and a ZTC pathway, right? There's there's a pretty significant difference in terms of the institutional effort or the institutional buy-in. You know, you it's it's one thing to say, okay, we've got some psych faculty over here who are interested, they're into it, they're gonna adopt materials for one one course, two courses, and they're doing their thing. But to undertake to provide your students with a consistent pathway through the entire program, whether it's a, a certificate or a, or a, a degree, 
is a whole different undertaking. You need buy-in from the, you know, the department for their major courses. You need buy-in from all departments or many departments for your general education courses. So that also brings a different scale to your, or different well, scale and scope to your outreach efforts. It brings uh, the necessity to map how one OER course here impacts a degree pathway over there. Uh, you wanna include your program advisors and your counselors so that they can guide students. Uh, ideally, you're involving your public information office or your, or your marketing department to inform students of this new and different and you know, thorough opportunity and, and so on and so forth. There's, there's so much more that goes into it. We've got a hand up from Diana. Go ahead, Diana. Hello, hi, I'm uh, Department Chair of World Languages at City College of San Francisco. And the college decided to use, uh, so the money, they're not giving grants to faculty to develop OERs. So that's the obstacle we're facing in world languages, it's a very time consuming process. Like in Spanish, there's so many resources, but to adapt them and, um, you know, someone needs to dedicate time. So my question is, uh, are there any other sources of funding to give to provide faculty uh, an incentive, a monetary incentive? Well, well, first of all, um, as, as pertains to the ZTC grant program, so I, I, forgive me, Diana, I don't recall which programs uh, City College of San Francisco, Francisco requested funding for and, and, and were, was awarded funding for, but once though, you know, once the City College of San Francisco completes the work that it has proposed to provide a ZTC pathway, uh, the disposition of, of any remaining funds is really a, uh, a college decision, so long as it can be traced back to providing a ZTC pathway for students. So in a sense, uh, you know, you, you might speak with those at, at your institution who, who, uh, who are in charge of that, those funds and see if any, any of the funds could be applied to, to the work that you propose. Um, Michelle, other, other ideas for funding in this kind of situation? Oh, well, it looks like you're muted. Let me unmute you there. Uh, while Michelle's un unmuting, oh, go ahead. I got it. I got it. You got it. Uh, I, right? You can hear me? Yeah. Um, well, there also are grants available right now specifically for um, o for adopting existing OER that are smaller grants that you could talk to whoever is in charge of those processes um, and see if that would be something that you look into doing. Um, yeah, I, I, I think, I, well, I'm not as intimately, well, I Oh, we just lost you again, Michelle. Okay, thank you. It's just that languages are not being prioritized at CTC pathways, but, you know, the standards like that you mentioned are, you know, like um, history, psychology, those those huge popular. Um... I, I, I would add, Diana, too, uh, you know, I was an administrator and I had kind of departments that would come to me. Sometimes they want to develop an OER, but there's a reasonably good OER that exists already. And so paying for the development of a new OER was difficult given the short you know, budget that we would be given. It just really depends. Uh, but there is some work, even if you take an existing OER and adapt it for use in a course, because you know you have to change all your assessments, you have to change your entire structure for your course. So I, I totally get that. And there, there should be some support around that for sure. Yeah, yeah, we I, I realized like especially like for Spanish. So it's more about yeah, yeah adapting it. Yeah, we, we don't want us there's no need to begin. And, and the, the positive zero. thing about, about Spanish is there there is there is a lot of work being done in Spanish and there is a collaboration cohort being facilitated around Spanish. So mm -hmm. a lot of materials will be forthcoming. Uh, a lot of OER materials will be forthcoming for Spanish. So uh, the mm -hmm. sort of barrier to adopting uh, will be will be much lower. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. Well if Anyone knows about any kind of funding so that faculty could work on this? I I, I will an say, email. <laughs> yeah, I, I will say you know uh, administrators can can get pretty creative about funding, and I know James probably gets creative too. But 
But when I was a dean at my old institution, I would uh, sometimes use uh, career technical workforce funding for certain courses. You know, that would that would work. I had a adult education block grant that was for non-credit that I uh, was able to access. There were various categorical or grant funds that there'd be a little bit of money left over. People didn't know what to do with it. And I would sort of knock on the door and convince them to let me use that money for appropriate courses that would fit the mission of that grant. Um, and and there's, there has to be somebody willing to do that work and knock on the doors and get creative. Uh, in some cases, I also convinced our college to use equity funds because our research showed that OER improves equity gaps for certain demographics. And so that you, you sort of need a partner, right? It has to be a broad partnership. You need the James and you need the Michelle and you need the um, college and external funding, all of that to work together. Thank you. Thanks for that idea. I'll knock on the equity door. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. And I see our friend Jonathan Poritz has joined us. Jonathan, I'm sorry I didn't see you here when, when I was when I was speaking. I want to give a shout out to Jonathan. He's working with us uh, to support uh, our colleges, our ZTC grant colleges uh, with questions around licensing. And Jonathan hosts for us a monthly open office hour. Uh, which is really, really fun to, you know, geek out with Jonathan and the colleges around uh, licensing questions. So thanks, Jonathan, for all your work. And in real life, he doesn't have a big flower on his head. It's just his bio picture. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Any other questions or comments? Oh, there's a question from Jonathan in chat. Uh, and, and he says, can you talk about why California went with ZTC rather than requiring full OER? That was something we debated a lot in Colorado. And he said, I suppose this question is related to the issue of whether you were involved in designing the program at the state level or if it was just delivered to you. That's a great yeah. question. Yeah, great. Two, two great questions there, Jonathan, really. First of all, um, I, I did author the initial proposal that went into the machine. Uh, say we would like to, uh, you know, we're proposing funding for ZTC, uh, ZTC grant programs for the California Community Colleges. Um, at, at the level of my, uh, my proposal, it was described simply as ZTC, and I did not get into the detail of whether, you know, non-OER materials would be permitted. And then when the legislation came out, you know, when the machine spit out the legislation, uh, the legislation utilized the definition that I displayed at the beginning, meaning uh, the goal is to eliminate textbook costs for students using a variety of mechanisms, which could include OER, but was not included to use OER. So we can quickly uh, understand, oh, perhaps it's uh, li commercial resources that have been licensed by your library. Uh, perhaps it's buying a set of commercial textbooks and putting them on reserve in your library. Perhaps um, uh, perhaps it's, um, you know, I, I can't think of other examples, but there are, you know, different examples out there in which it, something would not necessarily be OER, but could still be included in the effort to make a ZTC pathway. Having said that, so I, yeah, everyone understands zero costs, as Marita mentions in the chat, from the perspective of the legislature, they're interested in the consumer or the customer, right? They're the public, the students. We want to remove barriers for students. So zero cost makes sense. Um, the reality is that we do prioritize proposals that come with statements saying they're using OER to get to zero. Uh, we have, I can think of one case in which we've received a proposal telling us that they would they would purchase a set of textbooks from a trade association that they said were evergreen and were required for this particular career path um, and that the college was committed to purchasing another set of those you know sometime in the future when they needed to be renewed, but they had identified funding in the proposal, et cetera, et cetera. In that case, we were perfectly fine with it uh, because it met, meets the letter of the law. But generally we look, well, when we, when colleges apply for funding, they have to address a prompt around sustainability. How will your program be sustainable as, OER, as ZTC for students? And if it's OER, that's easy. Uh, if it's 
purchasing a set of textbooks or even licensing library resources, we're looking for the college to tell us that they have a commitment from their from the college to uh, access funds from X, Y, or Z source in the future. Yeah. I like that word that James is using, you know, sustainability of the resources. Really, OER is going to be long-term sustainable, whereas ZTC, if you're buying a few print copies to put in your library, it's ZTC, but it's not OER. It's really difficult to keep that up funding-wise. That's a nice differentiation. Thank you. Thanks for prompting that, Jonathan. Any other questions, comments? Or does anybody here have a ZTC program at their college? Well, I know we picked ZTC for a lot of the reasons that folks have mentioned and that you have mentioned as well, that oh. it's student facing, that when we had to make that um, label in our schedule of classes, you know, it was the, the thing that students would most easily recognize. If a student sees zero textbook, it's different from, oh, well, what's open education? What does that even mean from a student side? So it's, I think that's what prompted my old institution to go that route. Yeah, well, and actually, uh, Irina, your old institution has, is a great example of blending OER with library licensed resources. Yes. Uh, you know, I think a lot of your, a lot of the programs that that college identifies as ZTC or markets as ZTC do, do, do have a collection of, of library resources. And in the end, that's great for students, right? Yeah. And I, I would convince uh, different grant offices or departments to buy entire class sets of expensive math textbooks or science textbooks and just put them in the library on reserve so students could go check them out for free and make those checkouts last the whole semester, not just two weeks or a week or a month. So those were all zero textbook costs, but they're certainly not OER and it's expensive, but you know, those are all, those are all strategies to blend with your ZTC program. Absolutely. Well, great. We're coming up to the top of the hour. I'll say thank you, uh, Marina. And thank you, Alan. And I you know on, on Michelle's behalf, thank you as well. She was, yeah, very, very kind to join us from uh, from the road. So thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Have a great rest of your Wednesday.